Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. achieve, achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by author, journalist, music and pop fanatic, Andy Fry. Andy has interviewed scores of athletes and rock stars from the Smashing Pumpkins to Shaquille O'Neal. He has written for ESPN, Forbes, and Rolling Stone. He also has his own book. So we're going to be talking to him about everything that he's up to and his his experiences interviewing these rock stars and athletes. So Andy, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me along. Why don't you start off by just telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I wrote a book recently called 90 Days in the 90s, and I've, I've been writing professionally Oh, probably about 12 years. You know, I used to work in a cubicle, work um, in the, the business world for about 20 years and just started writing, you know, a little on the side, pretty much, I think, to keep myself occupied, keep myself sane. Kind of always did a little bit of writing, but never really had coherent and consistent habits about it until probably like 2009, 2010. And started writing a blog and kind of... Uh, you know, spent some time just kind of building some relationships and building some bridges and got to, you know, cover uh, extreme sports for ESPN. And I guess just sort of along the way, grew that to something that was, you know, the same interesting stories about sports and sports business that you may not have heard of. But whereas in the beginning, I was inter- interviewing, you know, high school, high school football stars and, you know, people did all kinds of strange extreme sports, you know, kind of evolved into this thing where I was interviewing retired sports legends and, and athletes, some of whom still play in, in professional sports. And it's been a fun ride. And along the way, just decided to write a book, a little bit about sports, mostly about music, music about rock and roll called 90 Days in the 90s. And I completed that a little while ago and published it this summer in June. So yeah, that's me in a nutshell. You know, just kind of regular, regular person who's a sports fan, music fan, writing about things that I like to read about and know about. And, uh, you know, along the way, decided to get it. Done. I had an idea for a book and decided to to pursue it and go forward with it. So, tell us about the fa- your favorite athlete and rock star that you've interviewed, and and why were they your favorite? Uh the, well, I mean, there's probably like fifty different people who are who are great enough that I could say that was one of my favorites. It's kind of hard to to narrow down a one or two because I mean, there's so many different personalities, and, and obviously, you know when you get to interview someone like Shaquille O'Neal and you're doing a Zoom with Shaq, it, it's kind of trippy because, you know, most of us post-pandemic do Zoom meetings with people that we work with or, you know, maybe this, for a podcast like this, it's not with, you know, celebrity, you know, kind of a world, world worldwide name that everybody knows. And, you know, you're doing a Zoom with this person like, you know, like you would your cousin or whatever. Shaquille O'Neal is really super laid back. You know, I, when he was in the NBA, of course, uh, I rooted against him because he was always beating my teams. I grew up in Philly, so I was a, a Sixers fan, and I've lived in Chicago since 1994, which is more than half my life. So, you know, cheers, cheers for the Bulls, particularly when Jordan was with them. You know, he came back for the second three championships. But, uh, you know, we talked about, talked about uh, you know, the role of the big man, which is kind of, I guess, compared to the 70s and 80s when I grew up, you know, centers aren't as sought after as – you know, perimeter shooters like uh, Steph Curry or or maybe younger versions of LeBron. But, you know, we talked about business and all the stuff that he does with kids and, you know, kind of raising money and promoting basketball. And I love to have conversations with people that are just fun and conversational. So I've had probably at least you know, two dozen that I can think of top, off the top of my head where it's been, you know, me having a conversation with a professional athlete or a sports legend. And we're just kind of talking about stuff that, you know, stuff that we're interested in and, in, in, What's going on in the world of sports? Billie Jean King was another one. I got to talk to her the second time. The day of Serena Williams' last last match, you know, a couple about a dozen, about half a dozen Fridays ago, I talked to her actually during during the day before Serena's final match. And you know, it's just kind of like hanging out with someone you know, just like you know, someone who talks a lot and 
wants is interested in knowing what you have to say. So I, I, I like to kind of engage athletes on sort of just kind of a normal conversational basis. And sometimes you ask them open-ended questions and you just shut up and listen. And uh, they come up with great things. You know, they come up with great things using your articles. And if you're doing a podcast, it's kind of the same thing. But yeah, there's those are two of them. Like I said, it's probably like another two dozen I could talk about. As far as rock stars go, you know, rock stars can be kind of standoffish. Probably one of my favorites was, let me think. I would say, yeah, probably a band called Alice in Chains, which is kind of a 90s grunge rock and roll band. And, you know, they're still around. They still play. I got to talk to their lead, no, their lead guitarist and principal songwriter, Jerry Cantrell. If you remember the movie Jerry Maguire, there's a, there's a scene where Jerry Maguire goes into like goes into like a Kinko's copies to uh, get his mission statement printed and you know produced before he hands it out to everybody in the office and ruins his career. And and Jerry Cantrell, Jerry Cantrell is a bit part where he plays like the long haired hippie a Kinko's guy, and he's had some other bit parts in movies, but he's really just like an intense rock and roll musician. We'll talk to you about music for like you know hours if you let him. And I got to talk to him. A couple of years ago, it was supposed to be about, it actually was about his fantasy football league, it was supposed to be like 15 minutes. And like 45 minutes later, I'm talking to this guy about you know, Led Zeppelin albums from the 70s and playing guitar with people in his living room and NFL football because he's a huge Seattle Seahawks fan. And yeah, you know, again, it's it's kind of boils down to what you connect with on people. Obviously, big names in sports and, and music are exciting when you get to talk to those people, but I just like having the, having the conversations that I would have with you know my neighbor across the street, and you know there's been plenty of those, so I've been lucky in that regard. Is there anybody famous in in the sports uh, music world that you would like to interview that you haven't got a chance to talk to yet? Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be a few. Of, obviously, you know Serena Williams and Michael Jordan and LeBron. Yeah, you know, I don't I don't think that they're accessible right now. You know, we'll, I'll keep my fingers crossed. But you know, at the same time, I've gotten to interview a lot of really great ones. So you know. I don't know if if uh, opportunity gets opportunity comes up to interview one of those three falls in my lap I'll take it but you know we'll see how it goes. Why do you feel like sports and music are so important in American culture? You know I think uh, so. Obviously, sports music have really only been around. You know, probably I mean since the beginning of the twentieth century, you know, pro sports kind of formed. In you know, I guess in some forms in the 1920s and 30s, and obviously we didn't start consuming sports on TV until there was TVs in the 50s, and we didn't really start listening to rock and roll music until there was FM radio, AM radio, and then FM radio. I don't know. I think kind of makes me. I have so a little side note. I've been to. I like to go to museums, and I went to the museum this summer, Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, and they have this weird little wing that has like a kind of a historic thing that details like what circuses were like in the 19th century. And I was kind of fascinated by this because I was thinking, well, I, you know, obviously people in like 1875 didn't have TVs, they didn't have radios. I'm guessing they probably didn't listen to live music that much. Not, not like we do and or could turn on, they couldn't turn on a radio. But I guess the point's the fact that at least in the West and in America, North America, we, we, we find ourselves needing to be entertained. And maybe it's because we're a big culture. We're influenced by the fact that we're in a big culture and there's so many different stories and experiences out there that we're just kind of programmed to sort of see what's around and listen in sports. If you watch a, you know, even a football game or basketball game that maybe uh, has a low score is, is not the most exciting. There's there's obviously storytelling that goes on there that makes us come back the next week to watch the next game. And I think music is the same way and TV is the same way. So I think music and TV are just, or excuse me, music and, uh, and sports are just part of pop culture. That's part of the whole thing that we do in the West it involves you know movies and TV and comedy and drama and I don't know I just I feel like we uh, are curious as beings and we want to know about other people and we want to learn about other people and you know sports and music are kind of two unique ways that we observe each other. I'm not a philosopher or historian, but that's just kind of my thing that you know now that we have TV and radio, we didn't have it 300 years ago. We can consume all these things and that's what we do. So yeah, I guess that's my take on it. Well, I know by reading through your bio, the 90s are real special to you. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I think some of it was I was, excuse me, newly out of college. I was in my 20s. Let's say I was, so I was 22 in 1994 when I moved here. So it's you know, the kind of time of, your, time of your life that you kind of move out of the house and start trying to be an adult. So I guess I probably 
remembered a lot of those experiences. And you think about, we tend to look at the past and think about how great it was. I mean, I think all of us at some point in our life, whether, you know, we all have difficult times in our lives, but there's probably some place in the past where you go, oh, you know, it was really a lot better then, or times were simpler when I was in high school or when I was just out of college or when I was single or when I didn't have, you know, didn't have any responsibility. We sort of build a narrative around that. This, you know, I forget sometimes that when I was 22, I was also broke and, you know, dinner was a quesadilla or ramen noodles, you know, and I had to do my own laundry, hauling it down three flights of stairs to the bottom of a department building with the four quarters I could save during the week. But I remember the, the parts that were, I was fond of, and some of it was just, you know, being in a big city where there's a lot of really cool things going on. And one of the, one of those things was music and also in the nineties. Yeah. I guess there's a change of scenery in, in the music business and in terms of what music was available. Like I, I was in high school in the eighties, graduated in 1990 to me, like pop radio went for a sort of fluffy love songs and, you know, boy, the first wing of boy bands like new kids on the block to, you know, Nirvana and tribe called quest and, you know, artists that wrote their own songs and played their own instruments and were more focused on being creative and not really playing stuff that sounded good on the radio. So and maybe that's just my take. But there's so much of it. I mean, if you, I feel like I'm guessing there's probably going to be, you know, history courses taught on contemporary music. And a lot of it is going to be on the 60s with Woodstock and all that and the counterculture. But the 90s have their own thing. I think like there's just so much variety. Uh, and, you know, Looking back at the 90s, like the political scene, you know, we had a president, Bill Clinton, who just kind of kept us always tuning in to see what crazy thing would happen next. I mean, compared to the 1970s and 60s when politicians were boring, if politicians were, were not boring. People leading our country were not boring in the 90s. So uh, I think all those things, there's always something interesting going on. And, and you know, that's what I remember most of it to be. Explain what time travel fiction is and how you came up with the idea to write time travel fiction. Yeah, I think time travel fiction, I mean, I didn't even know that it was technically a genre until I saw it slapped on my book. But I guess it makes sense that, you know, I wrote a book about a woman who owns a record store named Darby. She's about my age now, you know, in, in the present. She uh, she finds about out about this time travel train that takes, you know, whoever boards it back to the past. And she decides to just kind of stop off in the 90s and reboot her life and sort of sort of do some things over. So you know, maybe it's a Generation X nostalgia piece. But time travel, you know, it's been around forever, I think. Obviously, we've all seen movies like Back to the Future and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And, you know, there's a, there's a ton of them out there. I think uh, so far, I guess I wanted, I didn't really plan to write a time travel novel. I just had, an, I was walking one day out, just taking a walk, listening to some of my music. And I had this this thought like, wouldn't it be nice to go back in time to like see this band that I loved or see this artist or, uh, you know, see this or do that. And, and just, I got an idea for, well, that actually it would be a pretty great book. I guess if I could write a book, you know, about time travel, I, rather than go back and try to kill Hitler or prevent, you know, world catastrophes from happening. I just had a kind of a more experiential thing. So yeah, I didn't set out originally to, to create a different spin on time travel, but I think that time travel has been done so many times that um, I guess the people who are writing time travel, me included, fiction, you know, we try, we should try to do something new with it rather than, you know, a person heads up back in time and they've got to make sure their parents meet and they so they still exist in, you know, the future or whatever. Um, yeah, I, you know, I don't read science fiction. So this is definitely like, I'm not a science fiction guy. This isn't a science fiction book. I think one of the agents that I talked to who passed on the book said, oh, this is a time, this is a science fiction light, you know, not for me, you know, but good luck. And I don't know, I just kind of fascinated with American pop culture. And I think if I was to go back, let's say to the 60s, which is way before I was born, to see you know, just, just what was going on. I'm, I'm fascinated with how people dressed in the early 60s with kind of skinny ties. And you think about like Mad Men or a movie like uh, Catch Me If You Can. And then how different it was from like eight years later in the late 60s when everybody was a hippie and the counterculture movement was going on. and you know, live music was first being done in music fest. So I would observe kind of what people were doing, what they were talking about, how they dressed, how they expressed and carried themselves, whether it's the sixties or the 1920s. I'm just fascinated with those, those little things. And when I wrote my book about the nineties, 90 days in the nineties, I kind of wanted to recount that, you know, time period where people were not walking around 
looking at their phones with Bluetooth devices in their ear. Maybe our clothes were a, were a little different. Obviously, haircuts were a little different. Catchphrases were different. And, you know, what would that look like? And that's that's what I wrote about, I guess, hanging my little shingle in the time travel uh, fiction space. Well, what is your top five desert island disc? Oh, boy, I knew that was coming. Yeah, I've only got about 50 of those. So, to, so you know, ask me, ask me two days from now. It might be a little different. Uh, I'm going to say that I love Tribe Called Quest. <laughs> and I will say a lot of like people for, kind of from where I came from, obviously there, anybody who knows the full history of hip hop knows Tribe Called Quest is one of the influencers. But, you know, I'll just put it this way. Like a lot of people who were in college in the 90s who are white and from the suburbs love Tribe Called Quest. I think because we, you know, maybe Public Enemy and, and uh, NWA were a little, I mean, I think they're great, but they weren't, they weren't for everybody. But, you know, to hear jazz and different Influences of music and their, I'm going to pick their third album, Midnight Marauders, is my favorite. It came out in 1993. I just, it's a fun album. It's got all kinds of musical influ- influences that are all over the place. So that's one. I'll give you, I'll give you a couple. I don't know if I can come up with the top five. I love the first album by the Stone Roses. I love the first album, sec- yeah, first album by Oasis called Den- Definitely Maybe. Uh, I'll just say, I'll go with the first album. I love the first album by the Police, Outlandos, which was a little different than what they were doing at the end of their career. And I love Bob Marley, but I like live Bob Marley. So in 2003, Live at the Roxy came out, even though the concert was actually recorded in 1976. I think the difference between listening to Bob Marley's studio albums and listening to his live recordings is they're vastly different in terms of the sound quality. And you actually, like, you listen to it, shut your eyes, you feel like you're at the concert with Bob Marley sort of dancing in front of you on stage. So yeah, Live Live of the Rocks by, by Bob Marley, who played, uh, he actually had an American guitarist, Don Kinsey, uh, who's from Gary, Indiana, he's not too far from Chicago, filled in for, uh, I think, his original guitarist who didn't want to leave Jamaica to come on tour. And so you've got this great blues guitarist playing with Bob Marley, these great reggae songs live, just really great stuff. So I'd say those five. Well, tell listeners about your book, you know, tell us what we can expect when we read it and where we can get it. Yeah, 90 Days in the 90s, you can get on Amazon or pretty much anywhere you buy books. I do try to encourage people to uh, buy from the local records or local. Yeah, I, I've got it at some record stores too. I keep saying record stores, but or your local bookstore, you know, the just the local shop that's independent. I always encourage people to order from there, buy first from there. But if you know, if you're on the internet, go to the Amazon, go to Amazon. I was going to say the Amazon or 90 Days in the 90s.com. And it's a book that's mostly takes place in the 90s, but it starts with Darby who is a, a record store owner. She kind of was living the high life in New York City when her fiancé leaves her and her she makes a couple bad crypto trades and her career falls apart right at the same time that her favorite uncle, who she's lost touch with, dies and wills her this record store back in Chicago. So she moves back to Chicago, takes it over. You kind of pick up in the beginning of the story in the middle of that where she's just trying to get her life back together and she's got this great record store, but you know she feels guilty that she didn't keep in touch with her uncle and she has this great record store that he started as she had nothing to do with. And at the same time, gets nostalgic for music and just, you know, the things that had happened in the nineties, which was the last time she'd previously lived in Chicago. So uh, into the time travel piece of it, uh, there's this. Uh, so in Chicago, we have what's called we have the CTA. We have uh, Chicago transit authority has a red line, which goes North and South. The blue line goes to the airport. And so I made up a train line called the Gray Line, which is, you know, it may or may not exist. There's urban legends about it. And she starts hearing these urban legends again and discovers that there's a Gray Line stop under her record store. And after she gets up enough nerve and kind of comes up with a reason or two, she decides to go back to the 1990s, not just to relive it, but to kind of fix some things and make some amends with people and maybe try to redo things that she thinks will make her life better. But when she's back there, she just gets caught up, you know, to having too much fun, gets caught up in the music scene again, gets caught up experiencing things and kind of doesn't really deal with her, her problems or commitment issues, you know, things that are still, you know, ever present issues for her. And she has 90 days to either stay back in time or go back to the present where she started and, you know, kind of gets caught in a conundrum where she's, she's got to figure it out and it's stuck in the 90s and then a bunch of other interesting things happen. But because it takes place in Chicago, I wanted it to be very uh, focused around Chicago 
pop culture history, the music scene here. Um, you know, I name all kinds of bands. A lot of bands from the 90s, probably like 250, 300 musical acts are mentioned in there in some form uh, because she's engulfed in music. And, you know, obviously the Chicago Bulls of the 90s, Michael Jordan get plenty of mention as just a cultural phenomenon that was always around. But I think it's, uh, you know, if you if you like pop culture, whether whether or not you follow the same bands that I do or people my age do, if you like pop culture, you like contemporary American history, I think it's a good read and it gives you a chance to kind of see both the present and the past through someone else's eyes as they're trying to relive it. And maybe it's maybe it's a reverse coming of age story. I'm not I'm not sure about that. But at the same time, I try to have the readers just kind of tag along. I mean, I could talk about movies in the 90s. There's a lot of movies that I really love that were pivotal in the 90s, like Pulp Fiction and Friday and Days Confused, where you actually feel like you're watching this movie, but you're tagging along with the characters and going on their little adventures. And that's probably the one thing I aimed for writing this, this book called 90 Days in the 90s. I wanted you to experience Chicago in the 90s and you know what time travel might be like if you could do it. Definitely, Larry, Friday. Tell us about any current or upcoming projects that you're working on that people need to know about. Yeah, right now I'm just kind of talking about this book. You know, I wrote this book about Chicago and, you know, Chicago is a big city. It's it's kind of slow going, getting people to know that I wrote a book about the city and the music scene here. But yeah, I've been like doing some things that just like local music venues and bars and kind of having not readings, but you know, we're, we're, it, that's where we talk about the book. So yeah, I don't have anything, anything major coming up, but I'm just, you know, kind of putting it out there and kind of letting the let the community know about the book in different ways. And I'm not writing a second book yet, but I got a couple ideas that you know I'll probably unhatch, I guess, in the coming months. But just having fun talking about the 90s and talking about this book is what I'm doing now, along with just living life. I want your contact information so people can keep up with everything that you're up to. Cool. Oh, I am on, you can find me on Twitter at, at Sporty Fry. So it's Sporty Fry with an E at the end. And same thing on Instagram. and. Obviously, the website 90 Days in the 90s has a contact page. And you can order the, order the book from there. If you order the book directly from me from 90daysin90s.com, I'll sign it, send it to you directly, and include some swag there. You know, if you got people to buy for for the holidays who are music nuts or history buffs, you know, obviously uh, a book like this would probably be, if you don't know what to get people, this, a book like this would probably be a good good place to start. I'll close this out with some final thoughts. Maybe something I forgot to touch on that you would like to talk about or just any final thoughts that you have. Yeah. You know, it's just, I don't really have any major thoughts other than I've just been blessed to be able to to do what I do to write for a living. And you know, not everybody, get, not everybody gets to do that. I've had some really good supportive people around me, you know, helping me along the ways. And that's one of the reasons I keep doing it. So, you know, be good to your family and friends because They support you and sometimes in ways you don't know. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are a music fanatic or pop culture fanatic, Andy Fry, check out his book, pick it up, and please be sure to follow, rate, review, share this episode to as many people as possible. And if you enjoyed this episode or you enjoy the show in general, please be sure to tell a friend. Andy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me on. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.